But he does. And so my life is being torn in two between what I know God desires for me and what I'm willing to sin to get or sin to keep. My idol. Well, let's don't stay there too long. That's an uncomfortable place for me too, like everybody else. For many things in our lives play that role. But back to verses 7 and 8. So our friends, they slander us and all that. But remember, when you think about that persecution from them as a new believer, as a new follower of Christ, as a person who's trying to live for the Lord, remember that they will have to face God. So whatever they do to cause you difficulties, you don't have to get even. You don't have to get revenge. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay God takes care of those situations. You trust in the Lord. Now, as Jesus was speaking of these things in Luke 21, he was saying all these things in relationship to what would ultimately be the end of history as we know it. Peter says the end of the world is coming soon. So what? Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. We're going to be diligent. We're going to be prepared to suffer like Jesus. And we are going to be anxious to do the will of God. You remember that from the verse previous, anxious to do the will of God. And in this case, earnest and disciplined in prayer. Now we'd already said earlier prayer. So it's maybe cheating to make this another one. But I wanted to make the point. When the end of the world is coming soon, as many of us believe is the case. What was the key issue? Be earnest and disciplined in your prayer. Jesus talked about these very same things. What is the difference between earnest and discipline? Well, earnest is something to do with genuineness, integrity, honesty. It's not that you get somewhere and you repeat a bunch of redundant prayers, just saying the same thing over and over again, as, as some people do, almost like these prayers have some kind of magical powers that we say them over and over. Jesus told us not to pray redundant, repetitive prayer. But in fact, this prayer is crying out to God from our heart about the things that matter to God and the things that we're struggling with, that when I start to get that feeling and I'm going to take a drink, I'm going to call a friend to go and do things I shouldn't do, I'm, I'm going to, whatever it is, that idol, that thing that I turn to, and I'm going toward that thing again, it's time for me to earnestly fall down before the Lord and cry out to Him to lay those burdens upon Him. As he can bear it. He has power. His spirit within me can carry me through those things. If in fact, I'll trust him. And then to be disciplined. What does that word mean to you? Well, most of us, it's like something to do with spanking or something. I don't know. Right? But no. Discipline. All I, to the guys, I can say, okay, guys. Think about football. You got a, a player who's known as a disciplined player. Basketball. Whatever it is, what does that mean? Well, that means that they, they've learned the plays. They've learned the game. They've watched the tapes. They know what they're supposed to do. They play as a team. They're disciplined. They've got it down. Ladies, I, you know, whatever applies to you in that sense of discipline. And y'all don't know anything about that. You have to get up in the morning and this and this and this and this and this has to happen before you leave the house. When you leave the house, this and this and this and this and this has to happen. Then you have to make it to this place. You have to pick up kids. You have to get them here. Then they go to this activity, this activity, this activity. And you're thinking about dinner. And y'all don't know anything about this. <laughs> But in our prayers, are we committed not to the concept of praying? It, it almost, it, it does us a disservice to have the word prayer in this sentence. 
Because somehow we get this magical thing going on in our head. I mean, can we say, therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your communication with God? Now tell me about communication. For most of us, communication means what? Talking, talking, talking. The very best part of communication with God would be what? Listening, listening, listening. Which means we have to have a word of God. We have to know the word of God. So the spirit of God can pull those pieces from the word of God that we have hidden in our hearts and bring those things to mind and help us know how to deal with the situations that we're facing. So as I'm struggling with this idol that I'm going to sin to get and sin to keep, I need to find in the Word of God what it says to help me deal with that idol so that I can be victorious over that and not be weighted down in my heart with all the things of life because the Word of God then can rise up by the power of the Spirit. I can be anxious to do the will of God in earnest and discipline in prayer. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. You're going everywhere today. Yes, I know. But this is what the Lord gave me when I studied this week. So, so the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure. A craving for everything we see. And pride in our achievements and possessions. That sound right? Yeah. These are not from the Father. Oh, hold up now, preacher. That's not very motivational for my child. I want my child to take pride in themselves and their position, their achievements, their possessions. I want them to be focused on good and positive things. And, you know, okay. Is there a place in life for people to excel, to do well in what they do? Yes, and God honors them. Is that the reason that God made you? To make a lot of money, to have a nice house, to be, you know, the best basketball player on the face of the earth, whatever. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And the world, this world system, this thing that we think of, as this is how the world works, or maybe some of you ladies will remember, this is how the world turns. <laughs> There's a blast from the back. And so we have to think, we have to be a part of this. We have to think like they think and do what they do. And folks, I remember the peer pressure when I was in school, you know, it was just after Cro-Magnon. We were kind of coming along. And, and as we're going along there, people will come to school and say, Hey, did you see so-and-so last night on TV? And I'm like, No, I didn't. I'm like, Oh, man, I'm not talking to you. You don't even know what's going on. So they'd get together in a little group and talk about the latest show. I know y'all have to do that now. Oh, yeah. And so all of this is passing. What matters is what happens when the world is gone. The world's fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, there's only one thing you can do to really please God today. And that would be to recognize what His Son has done on your behalf. And when He draws you to Himself and you know God is calling you to confess that to Him that you're a sinner, and that you need a Savior, that you want Jesus to come in and change you and make you a child of God. God says if you believe in His Son as the way to salvation, He will save you. He will come in and He will change you. He will make you a child of God. That would please God. Dear children, John says, the last hour is here. Whoa! Two thousand years ago, the last hour is here. How much closer are we now? You have heard that the Antichrist is coming and already many such Antichrists have appeared. From this we know, the last hour has come. Folks, if we are getting that much closer to the return of the Lord than John was when he wrote this, 
We need to be turning away from trying to live for what the world says is important and to make sure that our first priority is to follow Jesus' command to guard our hearts and to walk with Him. Now as you think about living to please God, by the way, that would be the one that you'd run right down. That would be my number nine. I think maybe y'all have more by now. Live to please God, not self. Live to please God, not self. <coughs> 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 it says, Don't be fooled by what they say. That day will not come until there's a great rebellion against God. This is New Living Translation. Uh, the word apostasy probably appears in any other translation that you have. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. Uh, some people say, you know, it's always been where there are a lot of people who go to church. Uh, not so much. There are a lot of people who don't. There are a lot of people who claim to be people of faith. People who believe in God. But the scripture says the closer we get to the return of the Lord, there's going to be a point at which there's going to be a major walkout from the church. From the things of God. Now folks, atheism is raging in our country right now. They're buying billboards and signs on buses and spending a lot of money trying to promote their message on college campuses and they're doing a really very good job. If God was not intervening on our behalf with some of these movies like God's Not Dead, uh, some of our young people wouldn't really even know that they can defend their faith. But we would anticipate, not as we get closer to the end, that, that people would want to draw together as believers, there's going to be a great apostasy. Well, why do we bring that up? I want you to see what mattered to Jesus. Verse, uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 16. In this particular passage, it simply says, Jesus came to Nazareth. Where he had been brought up. And as his custom is ethos, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. This is what the Son of God did. If you know people who don't think that they, they need to be in church, that church really it doesn't have anything to offer, somehow or another they must be better than Jesus. Because I need you. I need brothers and sisters in Christ. I need accountability. I need someone to love me even when I'm unlovable. I need someone to hold me accountable whenever I'm failing and I'm struggling. We need each other. And Jesus created the church. He created His church for this purpose. He was in church. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. As you've heard this verse plenty of times around lately... Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For He, the Lord who has promised His faithful, let us consider how to stimulate or motivate, New Living Translation, one another, to love and good deeds. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the ethos, as is the habit of some. But encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day drawing near. So as the world is going off into apostasy and a rebellion against God, those who are the faithful followers of Jesus are going to be together in assembly more and more because we're going to need strength and help and assurance and love and discipline and correction because all of these things reflect the love of God. Now this is scripture. These commands are not commands that the Southern Baptist Convention came up with or some group of pastors. This is the Word of God. So, we're going to live to please God, not self. We're going to expect many to fall away. But we're going to fight for them. We're going to fight for them. They are part of the assembly. They are brothers and sisters in Christ. Yes, we know they're going to be people who are going to start falling away, but we're going to try to motivate and stimulate each other to love and good deeds and to hang on to each other. That is our job, our task. 
2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. For this reason, Paul says to Timothy, I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard that which I have entrusted to him until that day, the day of judgment, the day of the Lord's coming. Then he says to him, retain the standard of sound words, which you have heard from me, in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Okay. Now I have been guarding my heart. But now somebody else is guarding my heart. And so as I put all these pieces together, Many are going to fall away, and I'm going to fight for them. Stay faithful to my church and attendance and service. And I'm going to also remember that God hangs on to me, and it's not up to me to hang on to God. I am not going to get my salvation by being good, nor am I going to keep my salvation by being good. It is a completed work of Christ on the cross which I have to trust Him for completely. And He will change me. I have to submit to that work, that process of sanctification to which the Scripture re refers to uh, freedom. So now, as I think about God hanging on to me by His Spirit, there's another. God hangs on to me by His Spirit. And notice, if you would, in this passage, he is able to guard, is in red, guard through the Holy Spirit, is in red. I want you to rest on this verse today. For all the other